I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host, Words of the Prophets. Where are our prophets now? Where are those messengers God chooses to communicate divine revelation through? In the past, the Creator sent prophets like Abraham, Siddhartha, Jesus, Muhammad, and many more. Maybe our higher power has switched tactics since we reinterpret God's words as soon as the Creator's prophets leave us. Could it be that Spirit talks to each one of us individually and we haven't learned to listen? On Words of the Prophets, our modern prophets show us how to find the internal prophet that is the I Am, and we discuss the application of spiritual principles in all aspects of our lives. Love and light, everybody. I'm Reverend Phil, and I'm your host for Words of the Prophets. Sitting alongside me is my good friend and co-host, John Monroe Castle. Hi, John. Hi, Phil. Nice to see you again. Always good. <laughs> As today's prophetic topic is, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. <clears throat> and today's prophetic topic uh, comes from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the King James Version, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21. The passage that contains this topic reads as follows. And when the kingdom, and when he was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here, or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. There is a similar passage in the Gospel of Thomas, the chapter, uh, third chapter, which reads, Jesus said, If those who attract you say, See, the kingdom is in the sky. Then the birds of the sky will precede you. If they say to you, it is under the earth, then the fish of the sea will precede you. Rather, the kingdom of God is inside of you, and it is outside of you. Those who become acquainted with themselves will find it. And when you become acquainted with yourselves, you will understand that it is you who are the sons of the living Father. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and it is you who are that poverty. How nice. We're going to let you do this more often. I think we just, you know, read this and read this. It, <laughs> there's so much in there that is so important to those of us who are always looking somewhere else for our spiritualities looking somewhere else for meaning in life, looking somewhere else for the plan. And yet, we're told so simply, the meaning, the plan, what Jesus called the kingdom, or the movement or the reign of God within, is within. It's within. It's within you. Yep, that's what we're here to tell everybody. That's the purpose of this show. Those of you who, for some reason, didn't catch our first show, it was the same topic, and we went through a little introduction of John and myself, which we're not going to do. <laughs> and we also talked about what is profit, what is spirituality. Because spirituality, now we're going to read this. It's a quote. It's, a, it's in the yoga tradition. Um, spirituality is the science pertaining to the understanding of our core being and spiritual practices of the disciplines leading to the direct experience of this core being. This core being is the divine within. Behold, behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And when we can start to grasp this and we can start to understand its infinite power is when we start to take control of our lives and start to have our lives that serve us, that work for us, and will satisfy us. Hmm. So... We got through about half of what we wanted to, but which is about typical for what we two of us do together. And there's a couple of topics, there's a handful of topics that we wanted to finish up with today. And they are, I'm just going to throw them out there and we'll try to cover all of them. What is reality? What is duality? What is the law of karma? What is the law of grace? And then we have another thing which says self-help is a contradiction in terms. And we'll maybe get to touch on that. Mm -hmm. But I want to start talking about 
I think we even want to, before we get into reality, I want to talk about duality. How's okay. that sound? That sounds good. There were two of us. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it starts with a very basic, simple premise for me. God is everything, and God is perfect. So two things for me come out of that. One, that there is no separation, what this thing says to us. What was that line from Thomas? Um, but if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty, and you are that poverty. You know, and it says that the God is in us and it's around us. I think it was in John that said, um, I am in the Father and the, the Father, Father is, is in me. me. Um, what Jesus is trying to tell us is we are divine. Jesus also said, and was it, I don't, you're better at this than I am, but um, all this I do, so shall ye, and even more. Mm -hmm. Was that what we did last week? Nope, we no. didn't do that. Okay. Um, you know, so the message, Jesus was carrying, I believe, a spiritual message. And that message is that God is everything. And if God is everything, then there really is not duality. But there is duality on this plane of existence. And I believe that's what we're here to overcome that we have a higher and lower self. We have an ego and a spirit. We have, like those cartoons we saw as a kid, angel on one shoulder, devil on the other shoulder. And I believe there's a purpose for that, that we are here to demonstrate and prove our own divinity. And in order to do that, we need an adversary that is the equal of us, not... You know, if I was a professional tennis player, I wouldn't get better if I was playing high school, college tennis players. I, that, that, no challenge. I would need to play somebody who is equal or better than me for my game to be, you know, up to par and you know to keep improving. And I believe that's what happens in this path we walk. That we are given an adversary. That adversary is our ego. It's our lower self. It's Again, the names aren't that important, but it's, it's there to challenge us. And I believe it is our default mechanism. So we have to seriously want to be in spirit in order to have it. If we just wake up, you know, go get a cup of coffee, light up a cigarette, figure out what we're going to have for breakfast, what is my day going to look like, what shopping am I going to do, I am automatically defaulting into my lower self. I've got to start my day addressing spirit, acknowledging spirit, acknowledging the divine within me. So this duality is, is here on this plane, and it's not here to, you know, be good or bad. It's here to teach us. Everything that we experience is a lesson. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's where you know, the, this, this concept comes in. So, you know, our ego, our lower self will say to us, this is not good. But it is. It's happening exactly the way it's supposed to happen because now we're going to back up to that second statement. God is perfect. If God is perfect and God has created everything, then everything has to be perfect. Perfection cannot create imperfection. So what we are experiencing is exactly what we need at any given moment to teach us. What we are doing is being the most perfect self we could be at that given moment. It doesn't mean at another time with different circumstances, similar, you know, similar lesson, let's say, we won't demonstrate differently. But at any given point, we're doing the best we can because we are confined as a spirit in a human body. So we are attached to our physical, we're attached to our mental, we are attached to our emotional and usually it's our spirit that we're attached to last, and that's what we're here to learn, that the, the emotional, the mental, the physical, they're just teaching mechanisms. And this is the only plane of existence that this happens in. Um, Edgar Casey talks about that. Emanuel Swedenborg talks about that. You know, we're here to experience that which we feel and think, and this is the only plane that we can do that in. So I've been rattling on. You want to pop in or we leave you speechless? <laughs> You're leaving me speechless, Phil. <laughs> you often do. I was just thinking a variety of things while you were talking about what you were saying. Um, <clears throat> the idea that this is the plane of existence where experience is meaningful, where we 
have these experiences, we go through them as part of our learning process, our, our developing spirituality. I can't remember the name of the movie. It, it might be something like City of Angels. I can't remember. Uh, Nicholas Cage is in it. I think that is City of Angels. City of Angels. And it's, a, it's an eerie movie. Um, great photography, interesting acting, and a fascinating plot line for me. And one of the subplots is all these angels who can only be seen by other angels are there somehow to help us uh, to, to bear witness to our humanness. These angels cannot feel. They cannot smell. They have, they have no senses except for the visual. And one of the subplots there is that sometimes an angel really wants to know what it means to be human and to feel being human. It's like they want to come into this duality. They want to experience everything that we can experience. And I find that interesting because uh, it means to me that this life really is an amazing place to learn. It's also a difficult place to learn. And that's that difficulty, I think, we'll get into a little bit as we start to look at uh, the law of karma. Uh, what difficulty means, why we have it, and why we define it as such. But I think that there's a really important thing to remember, and that is, this is not all there is. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and somehow, we get caught in that trap of duality, that, that trap of not knowing ourselves, the trap of expecting something else to happen that's better than what's here. Well, that, that's the function of the ego. It's our default mechanism. So it does not see the reality. It changes, it distorts the reality. Um, mm -hmm. And I, spirituality is learning to move once again back. What's at our core? What's, what's our inside? inner core being, and what's inside is infinitely uh, and marvelously connected to the one. And that's the whole, you know, we're going to get into that with when we talk about a little bit about karma and grace, that there is really nothing outside of us that has any real significance that we have not given it. If somebody is making you angry, if somebody is, you know, you're lusting after somebody, if you're loving somebody, it's a choice that you have made, you know, but we are such a codependent society we think somebody else is always responsible for how we feel and how we act. He made me do that. She made me say exactly. that. The devil made me do it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and when we do that, we are in the throes of our ego, we're in the throes of our lower self, mm -hmm. and we are denying the power we have. There is nothing outside of us that has any real significance. God has made each and every one of us, I believe, self-contained units, and everything that we need, we have. The kingdom of God is within. You know, so, and we're going to get into that, but I, I want to touch on one of the things you said. Um, Edgar Casey has, oh God, he had 14 and a half thousand readings, roughly. And there's 25, 30 books of compilations of his readings. There's a beautiful book out there, and I forget the, the author's name, but you can go to Google Edgar Casey or ARE, which is Association for Research and Enlightenment. And there is, at the page, there's a bookstore. And there is a book, on, it's titled The Origins and Destiny of Man. And these are all based on Casey's readings. And the, 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 you were talking about with the angels. According to Casey, what had happened was, in the creation process, God created angels. Everything was created at the first moment, according to Casey. There's nothing new that's been in creation ever since then. Um, these angels were given divine power, and they were connected to God. So they had the power to create. And after a while, some of them got bored, and they started to create. You see, you talk about wanting them to feel. They started to create life forms on this planet. So the first were very simple life forms, and after a while they got bored with that, and they were not satisfied with that, and they created more complex life forms. A lot of the mythology that we hear about, um, 
you know, half human, half animal kind of creatures, mermaids, um, the guy with the half horse and yeah, the half, yeah. you know, uh, satyrs, something like that. Yeah. yeah, and centaurs and whatever. Centaurs, right? You know that and there was a whole bunch of these. These were the creations of these angels, and after a while, that was not satisfying. So what they finally did was they entered into the bodies they created, and what they didn't realize was that they got trapped. Hmm. So. At that point, the spirit that was Jesus went to God and said, we just can't leave our brothers and sisters there. And they came up with this plan, and the plan included karma and grace and reincarnation and how to earn our way back into heaven, so to speak. Hmm. But not through works. Through no. selfless but, works, so to speak. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, when we talk about grace, sometimes it, you know, we can't, we can't merit grace. We can't earn it. We can't. It, that's the whole nature of grace is it's given us. Yes, but I think there's two graces, the grace that comes to us and the grace that we perform. A and, duality of graces? Yes. <laughs> In this plane? Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, we touched on grace last time we did this show, but, you know, it's like it's about the grace that we perform. If I am doing service... In, in Hinduism, it's called karmic yoga. It's selfless service. I, then I am creating grace for myself. If I'm doing service for the sake of acknowledgement and reward, that's no longer creating that's grace. A, that's that merit. Yeah. I think we can buy our way back. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that's basically, you know, and, you know, when I talk about this stuff, this is stuff that, I believe in. I, I'm a very big fan, or more than just a fan, of Edgar Cayce's, and that's a story for another show. It's a story I know. I know that story. Yes. Uh -huh. I just sat there and the made you listen to me on that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so this is, this is duality, you know. So I really believe that everything we experience, I once said it on the air on my radio show, that you take... To, you take Hitler, you take Gandhi. They have both equal status as teachers. They show us what we can be and what we, you know, what we can be on both ends of this. Do we want to be selfish, self-centered, ego-driven, or do we want to be, you know, benevolent in, in service and basically demonstrating God's grace to us? I mean, when you ask the question, "Do we want to be?" I, I often think developmentally, we often put before us what we would like to be and we'd like to be successful we'd like to be all these uh, things in our lives and yet we hold back from that and why do we hold back from that sometimes people think it's because we're afraid mm -hmm. you know and I I'm, uh, I'm brought with me a quote from Nelson Mandela that's As, actually Marion Williamson created that quote he made it did? famous yeah he made it famous though huh? yeah I well, love this quote. Go for it. It's in his uh, his autobiography. That's why I assumed it was his. Yeah. Well, he was uh, uh, busting rocks on Robben Island off of um, Cape Town in South Africa. He had been uh, put there, imprisoned, and was probably going to spend the rest of his life there. That was uh, not determined uh, for his work against apartheid. And there he is, busting rocks, moving pieces of rock from one place to another, living in a very small little cell, and yet he did not diminish at all. His spirit remained huge. Um, so in a, in a sense, it was a place, a hard place, but a place of meditation for him. And he came into um, wisdom in that hardness of experience. And the words that he apparently didn't uh, create himself, but somehow he made famous, so he made it his own, uh, are these words. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our dark, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, and fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small doesn't serve the world. 
There is nothing enlightening about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people the permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Behold, the kingdom of God is within. And powerfully. Yes. And it's, a, it's certainly a lesson I keep learning over and over again. I keep wondering, one of these days I'll get it. To, uh, <clears throat> well, I think to, you've to claim got, my power. Well, I think you've gotten it, and once we get it, we get to claim it at a higher level, and that's what kind of throws us sometimes. Because we don't want to keep on playing at the lower level. That doesn't do any good. But I think it also, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a certain. Let me relate two episodes in my life. I am a Reiki practitioner, and I maybe shouldn't use that term. I'm an energy healer. I like that term better. Um, I don't follow, I started off as a Reiki, initiated in Reiki, and I got two degrees out of the three back then. Um, just as a side note, as I was getting those degrees, I felt like I was, you know, the Wizard of Oz, it's not something you don't already have, but will give you a medal if you think you need courage. You know, it was that same thing. I just realized from the time that I was getting that initiation that this was something I already had. Mm-hmm. My first couple of experiences with doing energy healing on people were incredible. I'm not going to go into to the details, but they were really powerful. And it scared me. Mm. I didn't want this power. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like walked away from the energy healing for a long time before I felt comfortable with, you know, being somebody who could, who had that gift, so to speak. Mm-hmm. The other episode, um, you know, and I talk about sequential. Um, one of the reasons I hope we have him on, I have a, one of my teachers is a Sufi saint. His name is Molina. Uh, that's his title. Let's just call him Molina for now. After an interview on a radio show, we were here on the college campus and we went out and talked. And when I was interviewing him, when I got to learn to talk to him, you know, I learned from him that he talked on levels. You know, like he'd say something and there was always something underneath. And he made a reference on the air about something like there were 500 saints as the Sufi tradition, as his practicing Sufi tradition defines saints. That at any given time there are 500 saints on the planet and that there are always saints in training. Hmm. And the way he said it and the way he looked at me, you know, I knew he was trying to say something to me. So after the show, we didn't do it on the air. We went out into his little alcoves for artwork and little desks in the campus here. And him and I just sat and chatted. And I said, you know, Molina, you know, when you were talking, were you trying to tell me something? And he looked at me and he smiled. I goes, yeah. And I go, are you trying to tell me I'm a saint in training? And he goes, well, could be. And that spooked me. I didn't want that responsibility. And I started spinning out my own head for a couple of days. And I, was, I remember you know, talking to God and praying. Like, God, you know what you're dealing with? It's me. You know? And as I was saying that, I realized, of course, God knows who he's dealing with. And it's like, what right do I have to question it? You know? I don't know if it's ever going to happen. I, I don't care. At this point, it's, 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 you know, it's irrelevant. If it happens, it happens, and I'll deal with it. But it was that same concept of it not wanting to be great, mm-hmm. not wanting to be something extraordinary or out of the ordinary or whatever. And I'm not saying that's my ego talking. Mm-hmm. If God's chosen me, again, who am I to, to, to walk away from it? Mm-hmm. You know, but that's, I can understand where, you know, that's what I'm saying. It, we, we get there. And then we get another lesson. It takes us up to another level. We get another lesson. It takes us up to another level. And the risk is not doing it. Not doing it. Yeah. More than doing it. Yeah. I mean, I think learning is a threefold process. It, it'll happen in varying degrees and length and intensity. But there is a, the first phase is we acquire some kind of information. The second phase is we assimilate it. You know, where we 
make it one with us. And then the last stage is we get to demonstrate it. And once we get to demonstrate it, then we're ready to go on to the next lesson, and that same phase happens again. Hmm. You know, so, I mean, I think this is a process that we all go through, and we can spend varying times. You know, the whole process could take an hour. It could take a decade. You know, it's on each one of us. How, how much time do we want to give it? How much do we want to resist it? Hmm. You know? I'm, th I'm thinking practically of my, my wife Maggie, God bless you, has always uh, been irritated at my unwillingness to play piano as, as much as I perhaps could play piano. And the thing that holds me back is my own interpretation of how good a player I am. And, um, you know, you were mentioning the three learning things, information, assimilation of that information, and then demonstration. Mm -hmm. And I spent uh, a few years gathering the information about music and about music theory and, and uh, piano keyboard technique. And I started to assimilate my theory and information into my style, who I am, when I sit down at the piano. And I've been very shy about the demonstration part of that. And I've been, I've been waiting to assimilate enough that I would satisfy my own ego, yeah. right? That, and, I, and I'm not going to go to the next level until I move into the demonstration. Yeah. Exactly. And let the information and the assimilation be what it is, the first two parts of this process. And then, you, of course, you start all over again at the next level of expertise, gathering more information, assimilating this stuff, and, and then further demonstrating it, and then moving. But we never know what that's going to be. Well, we can't plan it, because exactly. we're not in charge, are we? Exactly. Yeah. But what happens is you may get to that place of a proficiency in playing, and the next level may be for you to teach as opposed to becoming concert pianist. We don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, it's about just leaving ourselves open to the, to the spirit and letting mm -hmm. it guide us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me take a quick break here. We read PSAs on this show for any congregation in Santa Fe who has a special event coming up. And, you know, we don't do what you would call service announcements, but special announcements. So we've got two of them I want to read, and then we'll get back to, we'll talk to maybe a little bit about reality and karma. So the first one is, it's a growing in the light through tough times is the subject of a new study circle starting Thursday, June 18th. So it already started, so we're now going to be talking about it getting into its second week. It's on Thursdays at 6.30 at the Southside Quaker House. The location of the Quaker House is 1730 Camino Carlos Rey, number 209, and that's here in Santa Fe. It's a rust-red building on the short end of Camino Carlos Rey, northwest of Cerritos Road, past performance autos. And they'll be reading and discussing what financial experts and spirit-led teachers have to say about economic life, and they'll share their own hard-won insights. It is free and it's open to the public. If you want more information, call the South Santa Fe Quaker Worship Group, 471-2288. That's 471-2288. And about a month from now, we're going to have Allison Martinez, who's the, I guess, the contact person there on our show. We're going to talk about Quakerism, which is going to be a fantastic show. The other announcement is Dr. Larry Dosey. Is that I pronounce it right? Dosey. Larry Dosey. Dosey. Okay. He's a well-known Santa Fe physician and author, and he'll be speaking at the Center for Spiritual Living on Thursday, June 25th. He'll be speaking about his new book, The Power of Premonitions. There is an admission charge for the lecture. The Spiritual Living Center is located at 505 Camino de las Marquez, for additional information, call 983-5022. That's 983-5022. And back to regular scheduled programming. <laughs> I like that line. <laughs> You've always wanted to say that, didn't you? Yeah, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, what is reality, Phil? What is reality? What is reality? This is a conversation John and I had when we put this outline together, and I have a very simple but complicated definition of reality. Reality is anything that we stop believing in that does not go away. So what means in practical terms is I can stop believing in this desk we're sitting behind. It's not going to go away. It's real. It's going to stay here. Where conversely, if I believe I'm small, if I believe I'm not okay, if I believe I'm inept, in the, you know, put whatever adjective or adverb you want in there, as long as I believe in it, it's real. If I stop believing in it, it goes away. Mm. So you know, to me, that's not real. Now, the kicker to this whole thing is divine presence. I can stop believing in the divine presence. It's still going to be there, but it does go away for me on a personal level. So God is real as much as I allow God to be real in my life. But the other stuff, what I think about me is never real. You know, you call yourself a loser, you call yourself stupid, you beat yourself up. And you say it enough, that's your ego working on you. It's giving you an opportunity to learn what you are. The kingdom of God is within. You know, that's a topic. And you're divine in nature, you're divine in origin, and you're, you know, that's who and what you are. And it's, you, you know, but if you don't believe in that, if you believe that you're not okay, if you believe you're small and stupid and clumsy and awkward, nobody's going to love you, then you make it that way. And if you withdraw from those beliefs, it goes away and therefore it's not really real. So reality is that which remains after we cease to believe it. Yes. Except in God's case. Then it's that which remains even though we don't believe it. Externally, but not internally. Internally. Yeah. <clears throat> I think about uh, dear friends of mine who experienced the uh, death camps of the Nazis and this one particular couple, she came out with a belief in God that was, that remained. He did not. Uh huh. They both survived. They both went on to have a wonderful family. Uh huh. Oh, whom we see as often as we can, whom we love. Uh, you know, we're a part of their family. And I've often wondered what happens in the worst of circumstances like that. Where would I be? How would I stand my ground? Would I lose my faith? Would it sharpen my faith? It's an interesting question. And I think it's important for me not to just use that as a theoretical question, but to use that as a call to action for me to know myself better and better, to strengthen my own spiritual um, fiber, my, uh, to practice my spiritual muscle building, as it, as it may be. Yeah, and maybe one of these days we'll get around to touching on that, but the way to do that is meditation. Yeah, well, this is the way some people do it. I know that uh, <clears throat> meditation for me is more about watching all the monkeys in the tree and listening to them chatter. I haven't gotten much beyond the, uh, uh, the uh, initial stages, but what I will say, though, in my variation of meditation is my prayer, my prayer time, and not in which I'm petitioning, or asking for anything, but rather I am sitting with the presence of God in my heart. And that's probably, you know, we've prayer words to, here, but probably pr very similar to what Prayer to me is a meditation. Mm -hmm. I believe that the prayer is our statement of our intention, or should be the statement of our intention, and meditation is the, the practice of our connection. Mm -hmm. But they're both the same. Yeah. I, You'll hear me say this a lot. One of my favorite phrases, I think we said it in the first show, the Rumi phrase. The Rumi phrase. There's a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. You know, Rumi was an ecstatic Sufi. Um, Sufi is the, you know, is the spiritual sect of the Islamic faith. Islamic faith practices its devotion, so to speak, by five times a day kneeling facing Mecca. And you kneel and you kiss the ground. Kiss and the what ground. Rumi is saying is a thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. It, there is no wrong way to do it. It's not about form. It's about intention. 
intention, I believe, with belief are the two things that create our reality. What do I believe and what is my intention? Mm -hmm. you know? So any intention to connect to spirit to me is a meditation, whether we call it prayer, whether we call it meditation, whether we call it contemplation. Mm -hmm. you know, the terms we use are just distinctions that I don't think are really that relevant. I like that, uh, that uh, quote from, from um, Rumi also. I think about all the times that um, people fall and, and stumble and fall on the ground. That actually is one of the thousand ways to kneel and kiss the ground. We can actually, in the midst of our falling and clumsiness and stumbling, bumblingness, um, consecrate that activity to our God, to love. We can consecrate any and all activities to God. You know, that everything is a service. I don't care what we're doing, whether we're performing healings, whether we're preaching, whether we're picking up garbage, where we're driving buses or cabs, whether we're stocking shelves, it doesn't matter. It's not about what we are doing. It's what is my intention. If I'm going to do this with the intention of being the best demonstration I could be of the spirit within, that's all that matters. You know, I mean, I think all too often part of the problem in this society is that we judge people by the path they walk as opposed to who they really are. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of God is within. Mm -hmm. You know, so, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm an investment banker and I make, you know, a trillion dollars a year and you're nothing but. No, we're just walking different paths, which is probably a good segue into karma. <laughs> but do, you, do you remember the Desiderata? Um, in the 70s, everybody had a copy of the Desiderata. I've got it on uh, my wall still. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, one, of, one of the moves I made, I, I took it off the wall and it disappeared, but it's here. And, and part of it is you are a child of the universe. No less than the trees and the stars, you have a right to be here. Yes. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? I love it. I mean, that, that, that takes us to that, you know, every religion attempts to answer four questions. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? And we complicate it so, but that's ego getting in the way. The answers are real simple. Who am I? I am a child of God. Where did I come from? I came from God. Why am I here? To learn that I am God. Where am I going? Back to God. Real simple. Nothing... <laughs> well, that ends our show today, I guess. Right? It's, <laughs> no, <that's, laughs> it ends our show forever. <laughs> that's the whole, we talk about our core being, you know, our, the, the very thing that is us um, is answered in these yeah. core questions. You know, it, it, people, I believe, get into that concept that they approach God like God's a human being, so God's going to micromanage their lives, God's going to judge them, you know. And I can't believe in a God that small. And my life has proven to me that God is not that small. You know, that's, again, the ego getting in the way. And before we jump into karma, I want to just touch base about that, because it's about, I believe all religions teach duality, um, in one form or another, even when they say they do not believe in duality, as soon as you mention the word duality, you create the opposite, non-duality. Or if you talk about non-duality, you've created the opposite, duality. That's the yin and the yang. You need both parts to make up the whole, and that's why you got the black and the white, and you got the white circle and the black, and the black circle and the white. That the seeds of each, exactly. You know, so we can't have one part without the other, not in this plane of existence. I, but I want to touch, because we've, we've done a lot of, so far, we're going to, the flavor will change as we go along, but we've done a lot of Christian stuff so far this year, this, this show, three shows. Um, there is a, and again, you're, you're a biblical expert, where Jesus goes for 40 days and 40 nights out into the desert with mm -hmm. Satan. Mm -hmm. And the original Aramaic was Satan, and that meant adversary. It did mm -hmm. not mean something external. It meant something internal, which is very similar to jihad. You know, an Islamic jihad is not an external struggle. It's an internal struggle. God has created us to have everything we need. We have to overcome self, not somebody else. 
So Jesus is out there for 40 days and 40 nights with, with Satan. And at the end, I believe the instructions are very clear. And they're very important to understand those instructions. He does not tell Satan that you're converted. He does not tell Satan that we're going to, you know, you're dead and buried. We're going to leave you here. We're going to ship you off to a foreign land. His instructions are real clear. Get thee behind me. And I believe what Jesus is teaching us is the ultimate lesson of duality. I am now the master and you are the servant. Because in those days, get thee behind me is what you told your servants. You told your wives, your children, you know, the very few people who you let walk alongside of you. But it was get thee behind me. And that to me is, again, is a, you know, is one of those metaphors we talked about in the first show that people misunderstand. Mm -hmm. But it's about we're here to put that part of us in the servant's place. It's never going to go away. We're never going to lose it. It's not supposed to go away. No. It, it, the final going away is, is Jesus' resurrection. It's Buddha's nirvana. But up until that point, it's there to teach us. And there's always something a little bit more to learn. Mm -hmm. you know, but it's being able to recognize who and what it is, how it sounds, how it deals with us, and say, get thee behind me. This, uh, this part in, the, in this story in the Gospels <clears throat> is called the temptation of Jesus. And in the Gospel of Mark, um, it, the temptation happens, the, the correct order of things is established, Jesus has wrestled, he has come to clarity, and then the final um, sentence is, then angels came and ministered unto him. You know, after you, after you really wrestle with something and you get yourself in the right priority, the godly priority, then you can allow yourself to be ministered unto. Yeah, and there's a similar story with Buddha. Buddha was tempted by what he called Mara. Mm -hmm. And there was a series of tauntings, the way he almost relates it, that f kind of drove... At the time, it was Siddhartha. Buddha is a title. It's not a name. Siddhartha was not the first Buddha. He was the first to achieve Buddhahood and actually hang around. Everybody else was so blissed out, they just left. We we're off this plane. Goodbye, guys. You know? But he stood. And part of his staying was also a taunting by Mara, where it's, okay, now that you got this guy, what are you going to do with it? Oh, good question. I'm going to teach. You know? So, I mean, this concept of this adversary, this duality, is really present in all religions, and I'm not going to get into each one of them today, but it's really there. And I believe that's what we're here to overcome, which leads us to... Karma. Karma, exactly. <clears throat> so, we I, talked... Go ahead. I was just thinking about uh, karma, which, you know, karman, which is the uh, Sanskrit uh, word that has to do with action, um, effect, uh, uh, cause-effect relationship, what pe sometimes people call fate. And I wonder, is karma part of the, the understanding that we choose our adversaries, that we place ourselves in positions in which we will have an adversarial um, challenge? Yes, and so most that, definitely. So that we can poke through into the next place where we can have angels come in and, and minister to us. We get the opportunity. I, I had a teacher, his name was Chet Blau, and we're not going to get too deep into Chet today, but Chet was, Chet was a channeled entity. He was a 4th century Buddhist monk, and he was like the premier triple black belt meditator of his day. <laughs> you know, he spent 23 hours in a cave and meditate, then he'd go out and gather some berries and eat and go back to the cave, and then when he finally passed on as part of this review process, and we'll talk about that too, there's like, you know, there's like, wow, man, I was a master meditator, and everybody said, well, so, who'd you help? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he goes, oh my God, I didn't help anybody. So he agreed to come back as a spirit guide for, you know, people who would channel him, and I had the, the gift and the blessing to have to be experienced some of that, and there was a series of teachings which are pretty I think they're all up on my website there are 12 virtues but we're getting off the track here um, you know the, the karma we create according to what Chet Lao we created a blueprint that we create a well let me back that up for a second we come from a collective mm -hmm. and the collective is souls spirits um, 
in, I believe it's Revelations, they talk about 144,000 shall be saved. Is that? There would be in Revelation. The yeah. book of Revelation, I'm not sure of the exact number, though. Yeah. Um, what Chet taught about that was that there is 144,000 to be saved, but it's not 144,000 individuals, it's 144,000 collectives. And the collectives vary in size from a few hundred to a few billion, and they have spirits. And you work together, and within a collective, there are like families of spirits, and you work together with them. So you create a blueprint. You've, you know, we've occurred some karma. Karma is cause and effect, and the cause and effect are driven by what I believe is attachments. So we attach to something. Uh, I'm not going to help this person because I want to hold on to my money. I want to hold on to my possessions. I've just made those possessions in a way a false idol, a false god, and I've denied the divinity of that individual by not helping him. I create karma. Very simplistic. So maybe my next trip around, I'm supposed to come back and be that individual and experience it from the other side so I get to feel what it's really about. But in order to get there, I have to walk a path. So we contract or agree to with other spirits from our family and then our collective to help provide us hmm. with the situations that will give us the opportunity to learn and we create a blueprint which this is going to get into a whole bunch of stuff but time is not linear we i think there is time like i could be living in five different lives at five different times at the same time time is a dimensional thing so we get to experience yeah, we could just drop in at any time, drop out at any time, go to another one. But that's a whole other discussion. Um, I create a blueprint. But when I get into this body, I have free will. So I can change parts of it, not consciously, but just decide I'm not going to do this. I can negate the whole blueprint. And I can also exceed the blueprint. I can go beyond whatever the limitations were or the, t or the lessons were. And that is roughly how I believe what karma happens, that karma happens to teach us to be divine. And we get to experience it until we get to that place where we get to demonstrate I am actually divine. And that's where grace comes in. But I, I want to back up on karma a little bit before we get to grace. Um, there are three kinds of karma. There's, I believe, the karma we bring in from lifetime to lifetime which is what I was just kind of explaining. There's a karma that we, day-to-day -day karma, what I do, what I feel, what I think today is made manifest in my life. And some people are now calling that quantum physics. And then there's a collective karma, and we'll, we'll, that's a whole show in itself. Um, what I do today is manifest in my life today. If I create negativity, it's going to come back to me. If I create joy of service, it's going to come back to me. I want to back this up for a second. Two things that are important, I believe. One is that the only karmic debt we have is to self. We are totally self-contained units. Each one of us is an individual spirit that's part of the greater spirit. So I don't owe anybody karma. I owe me karma. John and I may have agreed in spirit form that we're going to do this show together and help one another and work with one another, but it isn't because I owe John anything. It isn't because John owes me anything. It's because we agreed to do this. So it's about not owing. People think we have karmic debts to people. We don't. We have karmic debts to ourselves that people help us experience. The other thing I want to touch on, we're going to be running out of time soon. Um, we have a... A, an identification mechanism that helps us find who these helping people are, who these helping mm -hmm. spirits are in, in, in physical form. And it, mm -hmm. because we're not going to remember them. So we have to have some means of identifying each other. And those are those kind of like you walk into a room and you feel somebody. Mm -hmm. And that is, I believe, that karmic identifier that says, hey, this person's here to be a part of your learning experience. All too often, because of the ego-based romance novels and all this, everybody thinks that's love. So that's not always the lesson. So we wind up misreading the lesson by thinking we're supposed to have love or lust with this person, 
as opposed to allowing us to teach them and them to teach us. And that's where we start to get off track and create new karma that we have to fulfill later on down the road. So, you know, it's about just listening to the spirit within, the kingdom of God within, and it will guide us to what we need to do, where we need to be. And the concept to me of karma, I mean, reincarnation is the vehicle that allows karma to happen. Um, and grace is the vehicle that allows us to burn off the karma, so to speak. That The law of grace, which is opposed, different than God's grace. Mm. The law of grace is that if we can do selfless service, we've gotten the lesson that karma is here to teach us, that we are divine and everybody's divine. And therefore, we don't necessarily have to have all those experiences we were originally planning for ourselves, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, does that make any sense? It makes sense. I think about uh, karma as a, <clears throat> uh, a system, if you will, of, of justice. That, And I like what you said about the only karma we incur is uh, about ourselves. It's yeah. uh, about our own growth. That somehow um, karma is about us bringing the scales of justice within to, into a balance that allows uh, for further spiritual growth and, uh, you know, it, it's... I hear that and I hear what you're saying. I just I have a problem with the word justice. That, that makes it sound like reward and punishment that it's not. It's totally teaching. Well, I'm using, okay, I'm using the, um, the carpenter's sense of the word justice, which is balance. Okay. To bring something into balance is to bring something into justice. Okay. Uh, you know, the, the scales of justice, that, that old image, yeah. that's where that comes okay. from. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we're here to learn. So all these experiences are, first of, chosen by us. Secondly, they're here to teach us. So they're not positive or negative. They're learning experiences. For me, one of the great gifts of understanding karma and its origins and why we have it, it allowed me to be forgiving of the experiences I had as a child. How can I be blaming people who are giving me exactly what I asked for? How can I put myself down mm -hmm. for having the experience I laid out for myself? Mm -hmm. And to me, that is where the you know, real forgiveness started to happen. It wasn't theoretical forgiveness. You know, it was about seeing that and at the same time seeing that they're all divine and you know, I was giving them experiences too. You know, and so that to me is really a part of that law of grace is to find forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know, and to look for it and not to you know, what did Jesus say, Judge ye not as she shall be judged? You know, and I believe again that it's a lot of karmic stuff that goes on in, in the gospels. You know, when Jesus says, what you sow, so shall you reap, I don't think he's teaching us about being a farmer, <laughs> you know. I mean, when he talks about judgments and stuff, I mean, you know, and that concept even in the Old Testament, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is about karma. It's not about personal vengeance, because, I mean, vengeance says mine to say it the Lord. That's what, Leviticus or something like that. But, I mean, you yeah. know, and, you know, so... Those are the things that we're going to keep talking about show to show. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things we do at our show is, because John has a gift, he, he sums things up beautifully and puts them eloquently. And so we're getting at that point of the show where John is going to just give us a summary of today's show. Okay. Boy, I have to live up to your expectations. Oh, no, I don't. The only karma I have to fulfill Exactly. No own. expectations, I'm no free. pressure. I'm free. You, yes. <laughs> What we've been discussing today is uh, what I've been calling a spiritual toolkit. Uh, we've discussed certain concepts that we can uh, use and, and uh, bring into demonstration into our lives. And as we've listened to each other and, and you've listened to us, hopefully you will understand that the, the most important thing said today here is that the kingdom is within Everything we need is already here. It's already been chosen. It's already been uh, allowed. It's already been set before us like a banquet. 
table so that we may eat and not only in this life in this plane but forever and ever until at some point we are released or we release ourselves so what we do is we learn we come here not to judge but to learn we come here uh, to experience the difficulties of our lives so that we may learn on this great cosmic level how this is important for us to grow in love to grow in mercy to grow in grace and all we need to do in order to to do all these things of, of growth all this karmic exploration is to believe the simple thing the kingdom the love the movement of the one of God is already here and it's right in you it's right in me and it's in you so let's go about the business of finding each other in our lives and helping us learn what's next so that we can go into the next set of challenges in the beauty of grace beautiful that's what I think this show has been about I agree I just can't say it that nicely well, I also know that um, I should probably refer to Phil now as St. Phil, right? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's leave that thought behind. Okay. okay, just a couple of quick announcements. We've got to put a wrap on. Um, I am running a spiritual study group Monday nights from 6 to about 7.15 at the Vitamin Cottage uh, Events Center. Vitamin Cottage is 4250 Cerritos Road and it's free donations are always welcome and we study different topics so come on down check us out the other thing is at the end of this show they'll be rolling credits so two things we invite you to contact either john or myself if you've got questions comments we'll be happy to deal with them also to know that if you were, we're going to read them on the air let us know if you want any level of anonymity or not and both John and I are counselors with a spiritual bend to it. So if you're interested and need some counseling work, contact John or myself, whichever one of us you feel would be beneficial to you. Trust your intuitive sense. Yes. Um, and those are the announcements. Well, who's going to be with us next week, Phil? Um, Chris. Next, Chris Grissom. Um, she is one wonderful person. She has the show on after us on... Thursday nights, we are on Thursday nights from 8 to 9, and she's on from 9 to 10. So uh, she's got some wonderful things to say. She's a wonderful person. Uh, you'll feel her radiance when you just watch her. So until then, I guess we are done. Thank you for tuning in, John. Thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. It's a pleasure. I want to thank everybody behind the scenes who makes this show happen. And just tune in, and you'll see our credits of when we're on the air. Listen to us. Tune in next week. And love and light to every one of you. Thank you. Bye. I'm Reverend Phil, and I've been your host for Words of the Prophets. Thank you for tuning in. Please join me again next week, same time, same channel, for more Words of the Prophets.